Good evening, everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting, but we're very pleased um, that you're all here tonight. My name is Professor Glenda Sluger. I'm here to welcome you today uh, for the, the lecture by Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, who will be speaking on America in Asia and Australian perspective. I'd like to welcome Senator Wong, also the US Consul General Linda Dwightler, colleagues, students, visitors to the University of Sydney and beautiful McLaurin Hall, all built on the ancestral lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, we also like to pay respect to the knowledge embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. I am the person welcoming you because of a conversation I began late last year with Professor Simon Jackman of the US Studies Centre, and we were mulling the strange, disorientating historical moment in which we find ourselves, or as Senator Wong has described with her trademark composure, our disrupted world. And we began to plot how we might make the University of Sydney a valuable site of discussion and research about that changing, disrupted world order that shapes our national lives. So in the context of those challenges and ambitions that uh, lie ahead for us as a university and for our programs, and in the midst of a sense of epochal, possibly dangerous political shifts that I think not only historians are, are worried about, and I often say that historians are the ones finding it hardest to sleep these days because we have long historical memories, but we're extremely fortunate to have with us this evening the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs as one of the two most influential figures in Australia on just those topics, who has already proven herself an important and distinctive voice. The proceedings for this afternoon will be as follows. Senator Wong will present her lecture, then there will be a Q&A with Mr Ashley Townsend uh, from the US Study Centre, and at the end there will be some time for your questions. So save them up, and without further ado for me, you now have the pleasure of hearing briefly from our Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Professor Anna Marie Jagos, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Welcome, it gives me great pleasure as the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences to welcome you to this Capacity Crowd event, co-hosted with Sydney Ideas and the United States Study Centre. Before she gives her keynote address, my task is to introduce Senator Penny Wong. Deans get given all sorts of tasks, some of them harder than others, and I can't actually decide if this is a hard task or an easy task this evening. After all, Senator Wong is somebody who brings out the truth in the cliché, she genuinely needs no introduction. You're here because you know that as the Labour Senator for South Australia, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Penny Wong is a hard-headed and passionate advocate for social equality, described variously in print as the coolest operator in Australian politics and one of the most formidable intellects in the federal parliament. If you follow at Senator Wong on Twitter, and some of you likely do because she has nearly 200,000 followers, you'll know that eight months later her pinned tweet is still that now iconic Australian political photograph, Penny with her face in her hands, surrounded by her upper house colleagues on learning that a majority of Australians had voted in favour of legalising same-sex marriage. With a strong track record in domestic politics, Penny Wong is now being admiringly talked of as Australia's next foreign minister. She's just returned from a round of high-level meetings in the United States, and during her time there, she noted that a key element of American power was the system of alliances it has around the globe. Those alliances have been much in the spotlight recently, with President Trump's presence at last week's NATO summit. Of NATO, Trump tweeted, we had a truly great summit that was inaccurately covered by much of the media. A fiery G7, where he was described as a one-man diplomatic wrecking ball, but where he assessed the feeling among the G7 leadership rather differently, saying, we have a great relationship. I would say the relationship is a 10. His meeting in Singapore, with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, 
Trump called this as a fantastic meeting, a lot of progress, really very progressive, better than anybody would have expected, top of the line. And the bipartisan outcry, even in the last 24 hours, following his meeting with Putin in Helsinki, of this meeting, Trump tweeted, while I had a great meeting with NATO, I had an even better meeting with Vladimir Putin of Russia, sadly it is not being reported that way, the fake news is going crazy. Unmoved by the US President's breezy self-confidence and a welcome antidote to the crazy making of Trumpian fake news, Senator Wong said in a speech in Singapore earlier this year that there was no disputing the international rules-based order is under its greatest period of stress since the end of the Second World War and that there is ongoing reappraisal of the way that the United States sees itself in the conduct of global affairs. Her timely address this evening will examine the role of the United States in our region as a trade war with China looms large and a denuclearization of North Korea looks increasingly unlikely. Colleagues, students, guests, Penny Wong. Well, there are a lot of you. Well, can I first acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Can I also acknowledge Amnari Jacosi, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I was not heckling you, but commenting <laughs> as we, as we uh, were listening and the people behind me said, be gracious. <laughs> it was very kind of you, thank you. Uh, I'll try and be gracious. Um, to Professor Glenda Sluger, thank you very much for uh, your introduction and your comments to Simon. Uh, Linda Dett, the CEO here, um, thank you for your persistence in demanding that I come and speak here. He's very persistent. Uh, to Linda Detweiler, Stephen Conroy, I think, is here. Stephen's one of those people who's got so much nicer since he left politics. <laughs> uh, to Ashley, be nice in the questions. And to all of you, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Well, the calamity that was World War II in the Pacific provided the setting for one of the most interesting, stable and enduring alliances of the 20th century, the ANZUS alliance between the US, Australia and New Zealand. And whilst it was forged in war, it has matured in peace. What began as a response to a threat to the security of both the US and Australia has evolved into a relationship build, built around shared strategic objectives underpinned by shared fundamental values. Our alliance with the US has stood strong for 70 years, but of course, our history, our friendship, and our cooperation is even greater. The 100 years of mateship we honor this year is a celebration of shared values as much as of military cooperation. It is the expression of these shared values in the work we do together in this, our region, and beyond that give our alliance both dynamism and fortitude. Our alliance is both contemporary, facing up to the current complexities that distinguish the Indo-Pacific area as a critical contributor to global strategic stability, and also forward-looking, facing up to the emerging shifts in power that underpin the dynamism of Asia. That Australia and the US maintain close links in the security field, especially through military engagement, is obvious whether through our defence planning and operations, defence capability development, joint intelligence arrangements, our high-level defence policy discussions, and of course, broader ranging consultations, such as the upcoming OSMIN, we maintain a strong working alliance. But our relationship extends far beyond defence links. We have deep cultural, social, economic, and political links that reflect a profound alignment around fundamental values. I've recently returned from Washington, D.C. I landed on the weekend back in Australia, and it was a compelling few days. The vision of the US president taking allies to task for falling short on defence expenditure before delivering some rather mixed messages in Britain, then departing for a summit with the Russian president, 
chatter and discussion about the place and weight of alliances, the continued imposition of US tariffs and quotas on countries ranging from Canada to China, and countermeasures imposed into response, and of course, a former Australian Prime Minister declaring that the American legions are leaving. It is worth reiterating here, as it is always worth stating, alliances matter. Alliances between liberal democracies matter. And its network of alliances remain a critical component of US power. Of course, I give today's speech against the backdrop not only of these events, but also a set of far more sustained and structural shifts in the world Australia must navigate. I have spoken about these disruptive factors over the last 18 months. They include economic and social inequality, greater numbers of displaced persons around the globe, ethnic tensions and the reappearance of nationalism, racism and populism. And they are accompanied by changes in the relative economic weight of the US, China and major powers and also by the way in which economic power is being refocused and reorganised. China's narrative as to its place in the world and its increased assertiveness in the prosecution of its interests also contemplate a different role in our region. We see more competition and less cooperation around us. And of course, there are the particular policy priorities and rhetoric of President Trump. In an opinion piece published shortly after the US election, I observed that we face the prospect of a very different world and a very different America. At the time, some, including our Prime Minister, incorrectly accused me of undermining the US alliance. It was to the government's credit that within weeks it did begin to face up to the matters I had identified. It is worth emphasising the bipartisan history of and support for the alliance, including its foundation in John Curtin's historic turn to America. So some 18 months into the Trump presidency, the possibility to which I alluded that President Trump might actually do what he said he would do has been confirmed. The President's beliefs and inclinations have also become clearer, although how they will mark US foreign policy in the longer term is still uncertain. The decisions made by the Trump administration include the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the Iran nuclear deal, and the imposition of quotas and tariffs, including on allies and partners. And these events are rejection, at least in part, of the rules and norms to which we have become accustomed. When this is taken together with the broader questioning of the merit of the existing global order, with the US president declaring that the post-war international order is not working at all, then we know the game has changed. Now, the global community is still coming to terms with this new America, and so too, I think it's fair to say, are many, many Americans themselves. The reconfigured way the US is setting about conducting itself in the management of global affairs is generating something of a global rethink about how best to work with the United States. We have become accustomed to the resilience of the international rules-based system, and we have been comfortable with the strategic leadership of the United States, which has played the central normative role in establishing and encouraging the rules-based order as part of the post-World War II settlement but this order itself is being challenged by the uncertainties and strategic shifts in the global security environment. I've previously said it is not enough to declare we take the world as it is, not as, as we would wish it to be. Rather, we should deal with the world as it is and seek to change it for the better, to shape it as best we can in accordance with Australian interests and Australian values, and just to be clear, we share those interests and values with many like-minded countries, including the United States. So tonight I want to start with the world as it is and a pragmatic analysis of some of the key features that condition and shape the character and attributes of our region and consequently of American engagement in it. First, the place of the United States. The US, of course, has a uniquely global dimension to its national power, especially its cultural, economic and military power. As the world's only global power, the US has had a foundational role to play in Asia. 
US presence in the region has transformed our own security and the security of its other allies and partners. And it remains the region's biggest military partner. And of course, it is Australia's principal strategic partner and ally. American primacy has underpinned stability and peace in our region for much of the post-war period. Its elements include alliances and security partnerships, economic power, military capability, and the strengthening and utilisation of regional and global institutions. But beyond military and economic power, the US also matters in the region because of its values and what it represents. Because values are central to our national identity. It's what we stand for. What we stand for defines who we are as a nation. Our values give coherence and strength to all dimensions of public policy, just as they inform both the content and conduct of foreign policy. And values and interests go hand in hand. And you see, the basic presumption on which both our democratic systems are founded is that all human beings have worth and dignity simply by virtue of our shared humanity. And this acceptance of the inherent worth and dignity of the individual grounds our shared commitment to the rule of law and to democratic practices and institutions. This deep values alignment is what has lent credibility to the fact that we have been partners in arms in almost every major conflict for over a century. We have consistently resisted challenges to the democratic values that provide the basis of the kind of global order we seek. And more than that, we have defended those values against dictators and autocrats who seek to impose themselves on both their own peoples and their neighbours. Second, the economic context. To gain a sense of the terrain ahead, I often reference a compelling chart in the government's foreign policy white paper. It's another act of bipartisanship. That was me being lighthearted. <laughs> Sometimes I have to tell people. Figure 2.4. So this, fig this figure projects GDP on a purchasing power parity basis out to 2030. US GDP rises from 18.6 trillion US dollars in 2016 to 24 trillion dollars in 2030. China's GDP rises from 21.4 trillion US dollars to 42.4 trillion US dollars over the same period. So within a decade, the Chinese economy is set to become nearly twice as large as the economies of the US the economy of India, 20.9 trillion, and of the EU, and seven times larger than the economy of Japan. So the trajectory outlined by these economic figures represents a fundamental reshaping of the global and regional economy. And it is a reshaping with profound regional implications and profound implications for the United States. And the odds are that this trajectory is likely to continue. The 2017 PwC report, The World in 2050, projects the four largest economies at 2050 to be China, India, US and Indonesia in that order. Now, self-evidently, economic projections are precisely that, but the trend remains clear. By mid-century, Australians are likely to live in a world where the four largest economies are all Indo-Pacific powers. Our working assumption should be that the, that the regional relationships and the character of the regional order will shape the global order in much the same way that transatlantic relationships did in the post-war decades. This, of course, has significant implications for the way that both the US and Australia work with our regional neighbours to ensure that this global rebalance is properly underpinned by operating rules that support peace, stability and prosperity. For example, the Trump administration's decision to withdraw from the TPP begs the question of how the US plans to define its economic engagement with the region. And we certainly look forward to further elaboration on this point from the United States. Free and open trading rules are a necessary cornerstone to an Indo-Pacific economic architecture that contributes to global economic stability. Third, there is our relationship with China. China is Australia's largest trading partner, a position it holds in respect of most countries of the region. And our country has benefited greatly from China's rise, with much of the growth and the real incomes of Australians being driven by China's own economic growth. And we should also recall that China's rise has enabled the single largest alleviation of poverty in human history. 
This is an extraordinary and unambiguously positive achievement. Over this last period, and in particular under the leadership of President Xi, China has evinced increasing assertiveness in pressing its interests. It has also demonstrated its belief as to its right to a greater role in the region. None of this is particularly surprising. As China's relative economic weight increased, it is unsurprising that it would seek a greater say in its region. The question is on what terms? I have spoken elsewhere about our relationship with China, so today I simply want to make three points. The first is to reiterate that we should approach China with respect, but not fear. Second, the Australian people do have a legitimate expectation that any government work to protect the nation's economic and strategic interests, which of course are linked. And unlike the United States, the size and characteristics of our domestic economy compel us to prioritise trade and engagement with other markets. And third, the self-evident point that unlike the US and Australia, China is not a democracy, and nor does it share our commitment to the rule of law. So given this context, how does the United States and how does Australia and how do we as allies and partners conceptualise and implement a revitalised engagement with the region? Well, first, we do need to grapple with the possibility that the playbook of decades past may be of limited utility in dealing with the challenges and opportunities ahead. Michael Wesley remarks that reimagining our foreign policy is going to be the hardest thing we've ever done because this is the first time since European settlement that Australia has had to contemplate living in a region not dominated by a culturally similar ally. So let's look now at what we want. Australia wants a region which retains a system of institutions, rules and norms to guide behaviour, to enable collective action and to resolve disputes. A region in which those seeking to make or shape the rules do so through negotiation and not imposition. A region with an open trading system and investment, trans investment transparency which maximises opportunity. In short, a region with an agreed and observed set of operating rules. So our support for a rules-based order reflects both our interests and our values because a region governed by these principles enables the sovereignty of all nations to be safeguarded and enables the stability that underpins development and prosperity. As a middle power, we also have an interest in ensuring that rules, not power, determine actions and outcomes. Asia is a diverse region, and diversity is best respected and managed within a rules-based operating system. The alternative to a rules-based order is hegemony, which neither safeguards sovereignty nor respects difference. This insight is in part reflected in the ASEAN operating principle of consensus. As democracies, we in the US respect the rule of law, the separation of powers, and the principle that government and democratic practices enable greater freedom and opportunity than does an imposed system based on might is right. So too in the international sphere, we support a system which channels and restrains the use of power that is inimical to peace, security and prosperity. Canada's Foreign Minister Freeland said recently in her eloquent defence of the rules-based order, we built a system that championed freedom and democracy over authoritarianism and oppression. <clears throat> the maintenance of a rules-based system in our region requires continued and constructive US engagement. Other factors are necessary, including the participation and support of the region's largest democracies, India and Indonesia, and the maintenance of the centrality and integrity of ASEAN. But without the US, this simply will not happen. The US remains the indispensable nation in our region. So how would we envisage a US role in Asia at this time? I've previously spoken about Labor's articulation of Australia's national interests at the cross-town rivals speech, I think. <laughs> One of those is constructive internationalism, which is my take on Gareth Evans' good international citizenship. In this per period of disruption, middle-tier nations such as Australia see a need to act with our neighbours and other like-minded nations in support of common goals. We see strength in agreeing and working towards that common purpose. 
Well, this is equally true for great powers. Creating alignment and articulating shared purpose is also important for the economic and strategic success of the US. It is as important for their success as it is for its allies and friends. Security and prosperity do not arise from a zero-sum game, but from the creation of international public goods that benefit all, notwithstanding that the economic security and political returns may differ in kind and in distribution. Speaking at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore in June of this year, Defence Secretary Mattis spoke of a US strategy acting and I quote, in support of our vision of a safe, secure, prosperous, and free Indo-Pacific based on shared principles. And his views are worth repeating. Our Indo-Pacific strategy demonstrates our commitment to allies and partners who believe their future lies in respect for sovereignty and independence of every nation, no matter its size, and freedom for all nations wishing to transit international waters and airspace in peaceful dis dispute resolution without coercion, in free, fair and reciprocal trade and investment, and in adherence to international rules and norms that have provided this region with relative peace and growing prosperity for the last decades. The force in Secretary Mattis's comments is the focus on the nature of the region, on articulating the principles on which the region should operate and on working with other nations to buttress these. As the world's only global power, the US has a stabilizing role to play in Asia. And the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Frances Adamson, drew our attention to this just a month ago, when she said that Australia's interests, interest is served by a multipolar region, a region where the US remains deeply and constructively engaged. Of course, how the US management manage, manages its engagement will, of course, vary over time. Secretary Mattis's articulation of both the objective and means of US engagement in Asia is one Australia should fully support. For the reasons I outlined earlier, it accords with our interests and our values. Additionally and importantly, it also provides more scope for alignment with other regional partners. A focus on the nature of the region and the individual and collective benefit to many regional players enables greater policy possibility for alignment than simply focusing on strategic competition. The dis this distribution of benefits and the consequent opportunities for collaboration sit well with the Secretary's observation, Secretary Mattis's observation, that US strategy recognises no one nation can or should dominate the Indo-Pacific. So the focus of US efforts like our own should be on the nature of the region itself, on supporting, promoting and building the kind of region that operates based on the principles and values that we, the US, Japan, India and others have all articulated and promote. And such a focus is likely to be more capable of generating alignment and therefore success than a strategic a singular focus on competition. And it is clear that others in the region must work together to ensure that the US recognises that it is integral to the region we collectively seek. US policy to support the objective of a free and open Indo-Pacific is to some extent a work in progress. The themes that Secretary Mattis identifies include a focus on the maritime commons, interoperability with the allies and partners, strengthening the rule of law, civil society and governance, and private sector-led economic, de economic development. It is this last element on which I wish to make some remarks. Geoeconomic forces are now defining the strategic landscape in Asia in much the same way that geostrategic forces, represented by military alliances, shaped the strategic environment in the half century following World War II. And whilst the geostrategic power of the US remains unassailable into the foreseeable future, its economic power also remains strong. The challenge lies in deciding how best to liberate the energy that sits at the centre of the economic power of the United States and leverage that for strategic effect. Certainly there remains scope to ensure that the US and its partners, including Australia, maximise consistency with the practical objectives of leaders in our region where they align with our own interests. 
our aim must surely be to better enable the achievement of their economic and social development objectives in ways that strengthen the prosperity and security of the region collectively. One obvious need, need in the region is greater infrastructure investment. This deficit is particularly acute in the Pacific region. It was encouraging to see the announcement last November of a memorandum of understanding between the US government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation and the Japan Bank for International Cooperation to increase investment in infrastructure throughout the region. Last month, we also saw the announcement of a new strategic international development fund by New Zealand Foreign Minister Winston Peters, aimed at increasing the flexibility and responsiveness of New Zealand's infrastructure funding in the Pacific. I welcome these announcements. These are important steps to addressing the deficit in infrastructure investment in the region and in particular in, on, in Pacific Island nations. The Australian Government would do well to seriously consider similar initiatives. And during my recent visit to Washington, there was growing anticipation that further development of this aspect of US policy was imminent. It will be an important and valuable signal to Asia. My friend Gareth Evans recounts some remarks made by former President Clinton after he had left office. President Clinton said that the US could choose to use its great and unrivaled economic and military power to try and stay top dog on the global block in perpetuity. Or it could try to create a world in which the US would be comfortable living when it is no longer top dog on the global block. Well, whether or not the US remains top dog is perhaps besides the point. What Asia is looking for is less a context, contest about who should be do top dog than a partner of enduring connection and relevance. As their economies develop and prosper, due in no small measure to the economic strength of China, the nations of our region are looking for the reassurance that comes from an engagement mindset built around creating opportunity and collaboration rather than competition and conflict. So in conclusion, I'd say this. I previously described the election of President Trump as a change point. Well, so too our region is in a period of change. The question is, what will the consequence of this change be? What principles and architecture will result? This matters to Australia, this matters to Asia, and this matters greatly to the United States. Thank you very much. While, um, while uh, Senator Wong gets dressed, um, I, I thought I'd just introduce myself. My name is Ashley Townsend, and I'm the director of the Foreign Policy and Defense Program at the United States Study Center. And I'd like you to all join with me one more time while we get you settled in thanking Penny Wong, not just for a fantastic and wide-ranging speech, but one which at least I found to be both sobering as well as optimistic. <laughs> and being optimistic at the moment is certainly no easy task. As you say, you just got back from the United States where you were at the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. I wanted to ask you a, a general question first, uh, which goes to a lot of what you just mentioned in the speech. On the one hand, you have a president which, in, in frank terms, is really critical of, and in some respects, tearing down aspects not just of the international order, but the pillars of that order here in the Asia-Pacific, here in the Indo-Pacific, alliances, free trade, liberal values. And yet you have an administration, and certain officials in particular, like Jim Mattis, who are very much staunch defenders of the sort of order, not just that aligns with our values and interests, but aligns with the history uh, of the order that the US built post-war. How does a country like Australia engage with a US administration that is so conflicted? Well, I think there are two points I'd make. The first, uh, which is a point that has been consistently made since the President Trump was elected, our alliance and our relationship is between nations. So it's uh, just as I made the point in the speech, it's not a, there's no partisan ownership of the alliance here in Australia. So too, 
uh, in the US, or with the US, our relationship is with the nation. And, and there will be times, and there have been times in the past, where we have had disagreements with particular administrations. And I think Howard um, had, I think it was agricultural, differences of views on agricultural trade policy and so forth, and obviously uh, the Iraq war, there have been a, a range of times where there's been differences. And I think the alliance and relationship is strong enough to contemplate that. Um, I think the second point, though, is to do what we are seeking to do and what you know, I tried to do some of tonight, but we need to consistently do that, is to talk about, to reflect as an ally and as a friend to the administration what sort of engagement we think works and is important. Now, no one, you know, we're not so arrogant as to suggest we can define US policy, but we have a, a long-standing relationship and, and we should continue uh, and be quite clear about what we are saying US engagement with the region should look like. The final point I'd make, you talk about the order and the rules-based order and Secretary Mattis' position, which I, and I think the Shangri-La speech um, was, a, was a very good speech. Uh, the point I ended on in the speech is, is one I, I do believe. I, I think this is an order in the US, in the American interests. Uh, so you know, I think we should be pressing that point. Now, obviously, it's in ours, and I would argue it's in the interests of, of, of our neighbours, but I think it is in America's interests. Um, do you worry, though, that some of those officials that have been the biggest defenders of, if you like, the status quo um, aspects of US policy, including Secretary Mattis, are not looking as, as, as sturdy in the administration as they did once before, and still others have already been fired or, or left, like Rex Tillerson, the former Secretary of State, H.R. McMaster, etc. Does that concern you? <laughs> There's a lot that concerns me. <laughs> it concerns me. I can say that freely. Well, I mean, there, there's been change. I mean, it's a matter for the administration how they handle that change. We can't influence that. What we can influence is what we, ca what we have power over is what we say and do about our policy position and how we articulate what we believe to be a constructive role for the United States in Asia, which is not just the how but the what, uh, and, and that is to focus on the sort of region we want. Yeah, well, turning to the to the what and and the, and, and the object of U.S. and Australian mm -hmm. policy, uh, you know, it's not as you say all about military power. Mm -hmm. A lot of what is needed in forging alignments and stability and and stability in a changing multipolar environment mm -hmm. is about investing in developmental needs mm -hmm. of the region, good governance, infrastructure, etc. Um, you mentioned a few initiatives underway by the U.S., Japan, New Zealand, and indeed the government here has also. Recently, as you know, from a Senate hearing, um, forged, a, forged an agreement with the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea to build a, um, a telecommunications cable linking those two countries with Australia. So there are these sorts of initiatives afoot that we see as both intrinsically valuable from a developmental perspective, but also strategically valuable uh, in, in the case of that cable to ensure that, that the Chinese company Huawei was not uh, involved in, in, a, in a telecommunications You're really making this Australia. question easy to answer. <laughs> well, look, I wanted to give the audience a little bit of context to, to get to the Sorry. point here is, do we need to be thinking not just about these in a piecemeal sense, but actually investing resources, maybe a new fund or something, to really invest in, in, in the region in geoeconomic terms? Uh, look, that is a good question. Um, and I think that, uh, first, we have an infrastructure deficit in the region. Second, we have uh, uh, many countries in the region who are seeking to, to well, rightly continue to develop and continue to grow their prosperity and to continue to achieve not just economic but social um, outcomes as well. Uh, and we should be, we collectively, the US and Australia and friend, friends and partners should be working out how we can best work together uh, to um, partner with them. I, I'm, I sort of think about this quite practically actually to start with before we get to the geoeconomic argument. It seems to me, shouldn't we, fundamentally, if, if, you're, if you've just been elected, if you're Mahati or Jokowi, etc., you have a series of objectives that you've promised to people around economic development, around social development, around the provision of health services. How do we help 
with that. It's pretty simple. I mean, that, that, that you can see we should be able to, and you know, that we do a lot of good work, uh, um, um, Australia does a lot of good work, but I, I do sense that there is a much greater scope for better coordination between like-minded nations towards those objectives. The second point I wanted to make was your geoeconomic point. It, it, is, it is true that um, economic power is being used very differently, I think, to uh, how, how it had, had been previously, uh, and we just need, we need to understand that. That, to my mind, suggests that if you take the moniker, uh, you get the regional order you pay for, uh, Australia and, and other like-mindeds need to think seriously not just about lifting defence contributions to a, a 2% line or, or something like that, but also in terms of our geoeconomic equities. Does that make sense? Well, I don't see this entirely transactionally. I, I mean, transactions are a part of this, but the point I was trying to make in one part of the speech, and I perhaps maybe wasn't as clear uh, as I ought to have been, nations have an interest in a rules-based order because that fundamentally is the best way to preserve sovereignty. So I don't see um, engagement with uh, the ASEAN nations or other nations in the region purely as a transaction around infrastructure. I think we can do better and coordinate better and um, uh, invest more than we, we do, but I think fundamentally there is an alignment of interest because we, 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 we are all wanting an order which reflects our sovereignty and our independence. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too partisan, but I, I think there is a, a problem when you cut $11 billion from your aid budget um, to then to think about how you leverage your soft power. We're the lowest, uh, lowest aid spend ever recorded as a proportion of national income. And, we're and also tracking downwards. And we're also a country that is less able to leverage our private sector for these sorts of sure. regional engagements. That's true. I'd like to uh, turn now to wow. some questions from the audience. Uh, see who I, I, we know we have two roving microphones. Um, first question down here up the front, please. Uh, and then I'll come over on the left-hand side next. Please, gentlemen, there, uh, standing. Senator Wong, you referenced the 100-year relationship um, between the USA and Australia, and just over 100 years ago, uh, Monash had the opportunity to command USA forces in World War I at Hamel. Mm. Um, if you become foreign minister and you had the opportunity to sway um, the USA government for one area of engagement with this region, what would that area be? Do I only get one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do a principle and a policy because I have to have two bites. I mean, the principle is, and, and I, think, uh, I think it is self-evident, uh, that alliances matter and the nature of the regional order matters. And it isn't just, doesn't, as I said, it doesn't just matter to us. I think it matters to the United States, particularly longer term. But the, the, probably the principle... Um, point I'd make is we need better coordination between allies and partners, uh, particularly on the economic piece. So we, we've, leaving aside what people's views on the Trans-Pacific Partnership are, the withdrawal from that means that this administration's economic engagement with the region, I think, is, um, well, there, there's more yet to do because I think the region is saying, okay, well, the TPP is, you're, you're out of the TPP, so what next? So I think, uh, um, having clarity around that economic engagement uh, would be a smart thing. I believe I have a question over here, Drew. Did... Sorry, hands up, please, so we can see. It's, it's very hard to see here. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've come, become accustomed to the idea that in a few decades, we will be living in a world where China dominates and that this is the country that's going to be the most important country for Australia to interact with. But you've made the point that in 2050, um, the, the fourth largest economy in the world is going to be Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is not going to be as big as China, but it's going to be a hell of a lot closer. I've heard very little about 
what our relationship is going to be with Indonesia in a few decades, a great deal more about what China might be doing in that time. Are we making a mistake here? Are we focusing too much on China? And we should be thinking a lot more about what Indonesia is going to mean for our immediate backyard. I think there's certainly been a lot of media commentary and focus on China. Uh, and I'm not sure all of that has been a helpful discussion. Um, uh, your very, your, your, I suppose, implied criticism is correct. I think that we uh, probably talk less and think less about Indonesia in, in terms of our public policy discussion and foreign policy discussion than we should. Uh, I do think there is a, a it is well understood, um, and to be fair, I think on both sides of politics, um, whatever my criticisms might be of the government, how, how important Indonesia is. I mean, we, we resource our footprint, our diplomatic footprint there, uh, we very uh, greatly. Uh, we uh, invest a lot in a lot of partnerships there. When I was finance minister, for example, there were finance and treasury officials working closely with Indonesia officials. Uh, so you're right, uh, it has to be a priority. It's, um, it's a critical relationship for us, not just as a bilateral, in bilateral terms, but of course Indonesia is critical to ASEAN, which is, which is um, um, such an important entity for Australia too. So uh, we, we will, if we have the opportunity to win government, I think we will be looking at you know, how do we broaden and deepen the relationship and how do we, I think, do better as Australians in terms of our own Asia literacy, which we are still extremely um, lacking in. Um, Chris Bowen is obviously very focused on Indonesia, including doing, a, I think, a diploma in Indonesian studies or Indonesian language, um, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, and you know, we, we know that we have a lot more to do, I think, domestically, not just on Indonesia, but Asia literacy in the broader, and Asia capability in the broader sense. Now, do I have some other questions out there? The lady up the back there, towards the back left corner, please. And I'll ask if we can just pre-organise another one on this side of the room for, for afterwards. I'll come to you in a moment. Hi, Senator Wong. That's not the lady you called, I don't think, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. I'm a man, I promise. Um, would a Labor government consider collaboration with the PRC on Belt and Road Initiative projects in the Asia-Pacific region to, quote, remedy the deficit of infrastructure investment? If, if such projects accorded with our national interest, yes. I'm struggling here. I can't see. Uh, Drew, would you mind passing uh, the microphone to any hands that are up? We're going to do... Can I tell you one of the things I do? And, of course, this is me taking over, Ashley. But after I have Please. three men in a row, I usually indicate to the audience that the next question should come from a woman. <laughs> it's quite interesting how it changes things. I've, I've been trying to find you... No, a I'm not having a go, yes. ...lady here... <laughs> Poor man, he now feels like a Please, tom -tom. every lady in the room stand and we will ask a question. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Hi, Senator Wong. There we go. I'm a lady and I'm asking a question. Um, <laughs> so that's an achievement, there I guess. Uh, I wanted to ask you, just on follow, following up from that previous question, so what would you like to see from the US and also what la role would you like Australia to play in the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank? Well, we already are playing a role in the AIIB, aren't we? So, uh, and not many, well, interestingly, uh, I'm sure someone in the room, because I'm in a university, will correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is that a lot of BRI funding does not actually go through the, um, the bank. It goes through um, other investment vehicles. Um, so uh, I always thought the, uh, there was merit in, the, in Australia being involved in the, in the bank. I think that... Uh, it, it is a, uh, it's, it's a good thing to have, have, be, have investment in infrastructure, um, provided that the arrangements are, you know, reflect, uh, are sound, uh, they don't undermine sovereignty long term, 
uh, that you maximise benefit. So I, I think that uh, Australian involvement in, in the AIIB is a sensible course, and I think eventually the government came to the same position. But as I said, I, I think a lot of BRI uh, projects are not funded by that bank. We have time for one more question from another I'm lady photo on taken, so the right-hand side straight. of the room. Um, if we could please identify one, and <laughs> there we are. It's all right, I just, <laughs> we don't have to now. just, you know. <laughs> relationship with China, I wonder whether you would, because you've mentioned several times the importance of having principles that are brought to bear on policy, and I wonder if you would like to summarise some of the principles that you would bring to bear in a future evolving relationship with a growing power like China. Yes, I did make the point I've actually given a couple of speeches about China, so I didn't, um, I just picked up three points I wanted to make, I suppose, referentially here. Um, uh, I've said that the, I think the relationship with China, um, first we should, as I said, approach them, approach China with respect, not fear. Second, uh, that we recognise, we should recognise there are areas where our interests will converge and we should work uh, to, uh, we should resource those and then there, will, there are areas where our interests differ and we ought not shy away from those. The third point I'd make is that the relationship I think requires consistency, uh, clarity of purpose and discipline. Uh, across government, uh, and I have made some criticisms in, in respect of um, both consistency and discipline not being present in some of the ways in which some government ministers uh, have engaged on, on recent public issues. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately that's all we have time for this evening, but I'd ask you to please join me in thanking Senator Wong. Thank you very much.